okay, so our first speaker of the day uh, works at Telltale, where she started as a concept artist, uh, but then transitioned into narrative design. She's here to share her experiences on crafting compelling choice-based stories. Please welcome Molly Maloney. Thank you. Hello, good morning. It's bright and early on a Thursday. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Molly Maloney, and I am a narrative designer at Telltale. Uh, really quick, I just want to thank Consul for having me. I'm super excited to be here and meeting all of you guys, so thank you. Um, so yeah, really quick before I start going into this talk, so uh, as, as was said before, I started at uh, Telltale initially as a concept artist uh, and actually switched into the narrative designer role over a period of projects, um, which was a, a strange and interesting sort of evolution. Uh, and because of that, the way that I've structured this talk is actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a lot of training as a narrative designer. I learned a lot on the go, um, just kind of doing the job. And so this talk is kind of designed to be uh, tips and tricks, uh, kind of practical things that you can do if you want to uh, fold choices and, and, uh, and choice space and branching narrative into your game. Uh, so just really quick, the lens through which I'm gonna talk about narrative design is in a telltale way, which we're pretty atypical, I would say, in the video game industry. Uh, we make these story-based games. So just try and think about it from that point of view. Um, there are lots of different types of uh, choices in games, but the ones I'm gonna be focusing on are mostly dialogue-driven. Um, so this is out on a lane, practical approaches to branching story. Um, and I, uh, I like to draw, so I put doodles in. <laughs> so, um, uh, first of all, I just want to talk about, like, when I started thinking about giving this talk, I wanted to think about a little bit narrative design, what is it? Because, frankly, uh, you talk to, I actually talked to a bunch of my game developer friends uh, who work in this job, and you ask five different developers what a narrative designer is, and you'll get five different answers. Um, so, I actually looked online and, like, checked to see what people thought. And the thing that I can find in common, no matter who you talk to, is, a game designer enables your players to basically engage with the world you've made. And you do this through choices, consequences, and also interactions. This is like the most basic version of narrative design. We're the people who actually help players really feel immersed in a world through narrative. Um, and so the biggest thing that it's important to remember when you're creating a choice space or a branching game is that the strongest engagement is active, it's not passive, which I feel like a lot of the topics that I might talk about feel kind of basic and rudimentary, but they're the heart and soul of like what my job is. Um, we wanna make sure that the player is always driving the experience. So now that we're all narrative designers, um, let's talk about choice. So more and more video games are putting choices in, uh, which excites me. Choice space is kind of one of the reasons I got into games in the first place. Um, but it's actually a lot harder than it looks. Um, choices are one of those tricky things where, uh, you know, you create a situation, you're like, oh, there could be a really cool choice here. Um, but uh, sometimes, I'm sure you've all had examples where you open up a game and you're like, oh, this is a silly choice. Like, um, it's not actually as easy as you might think it is. So choice is something that you have to build a game around. Uh, it's not something that you can really, uh, I find, put in later. Um, so really quick before I start launching into specific examples and different ways to work, um, I just wanted to give like some, these are basically telltale kind of, this is the kind of conversation that I have at work with our designers all the time. These are the basics when we come ar around trying to decide what a good choice is gonna be. There are three main ideas that we like to keep in mind. One is set up a choice with a good feeder line or situation. A feeder line, 
is the last line that a character says to you before that choice space appears. And a good feeder, be it a line or a situation, can make or break your choice space. Um, you know, it, I can come up with the most incredible choice I think <laughs> I've ever made, and if I get a line from, uh, say, uh, the writer I'm working with that doesn't actually lead into that very well, uh, it'll kill it, it won't be good. I'll have to actually change the whole choice around it. So feeder lines are super important. Make sure your choice is changing something. I mean, this seems really basic, but it's actually pretty hard to do, especially when we're all working with constraints. Um, so trying to figure out a way, even if it's a very small thing, even if your choice doesn't seem like it has a big impact, it can still affect a relationship, have good role play. There are all kinds of different ways to make your choice change something that doesn't actually have to split your, uh, your plot or your, or your story or your locations. And then finally, choices need to have clear rails. And rails are something that we talk about a lot at Telltale when we're coming up with choice space. So I kind of want to explain what that means. So choices need rails, as in role play rails. So um, like the rails on a train, like you don't want the rails to collide with each other or the trains will hit and it'll be terrible. Um, role play rails are basically Every time you see a choice space, and at Telltale, we tend to work with choices in threes, where there are three different choices for any situation. Um, choices, each one of those choices that you see up there, it's basically a pillar of your player character's personality. And that's how we think about it. So like if you imagine, uh, right now one of the projects I've been working on recently has been our Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. Star-Lord is uh, one of those characters where it's like, I know who Star-Lord is, you know, like I know um, probably what he will or won't do. Every option of a choice that I offer when you're playing as Star-Lord they all need to feel like three different separate parts of Star-Lord's personality. So uh, an example might be, you know, there's the snarky, jokey Star-Lord, there's the heroic Star-Lord, or there's the, um, you know, kind of like, uh, I don't know, even like a kind of a bruiser, thuggish Star-Lord. It's pretty rare, but you know, there's like different kind of rails, role play rails that we offer. Um, so they're the pillars of your player character's personality. And defining player character will help inform your rails. And this is a, a, a kind of a cheat that I find very useful. A um, lot of times you'll come up with, uh, there's different philosophies on what a player character should or shouldn't be. Uh, a lot of people uh, subscribe to the philosophy that the player needs to kind of build the character through their own play. I find that it's a, a marriage of the two. Obviously you want the player to own the character that they're, that they're, that they're playing but having a little bit of um, the, the player character talking outside of player control can really inform uh, that choice space and save you a lot of um, pain and effort. Uh, it also defines what your player character won't do. Like I probably wouldn't have Star-Lord murder somebody. It doesn't really feel in line for him, so why would I offer that as a choice? It saves you time by giving you, uh, by letting you kind of define that player character, you end up in a situation where your choices become a little easier to craft. <laughs> there we go. So what makes a choice good? Um, in my opinion, from my experience, there are a few things that make good choices. Um, first of all, there is no right answer. Uh, good choices need to have something compelling about all sides. And also, uh, the idea, if you've got one choice that is right and one choice that is wrong, uh, to me that's not really a choice, it's more of a calculation. Um, you know, the studious player will basically know, like, this is the thing that will give me what I want and this is the thing that won't be good. Calculations can be really great, but I don't really consider them compelling choices. And there's a time and place for everything, but when we're talking about choices, each option should be compelling in their own way. Uh, there shouldn't be something that uh, is obviously wrong. That's not a choice anymore. That's just, do I want to play right or do I want to play wrong? Um, also, good choices usually make a difference. Uh, not all choices have to make a difference to be honest, um, but you know, the greatest choices I would consider uh, really feel like they change something in a, in a way. And even if there isn't an impact, it's always great if it feels like there could be. Um, the player should always be wondering, is this gonna be the choice that's gonna make a big difference? Uh, and ideally, it should. So, in my opinion, good choices make a real difference. Okay choices at least teach us something we didn't know before about ourselves, about our player character, about the characters that we're hanging out with. 
And bad choices, they simply move the game along. Um, sometimes we have to do these too, but you know, uh, it's good to kind of try and look at what you're doing with your choice space and, uh, and be aware of what kind of choices you're offering. If you're offering a number of choices in a row that are just moving the plot along, maybe reevaluate um, what is going on in your game at that time. So with all of that in mind, uh, I have like a little cheat sheet that usually when we're coming up with choice space, I will compare my choices against. I usually ask myself, why is this choice here? Uh, at Telltale, we work with games in, we call them scenes, uh, because we're very story driven. So it's scene, 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 kind of like a, a movie script. And uh, in, when we evaluate these scenes, uh, I look at the sets of choices throughout them and kind of ask myself this question. And there are a lot of answers. It might be because it's a good role play opportunity, or because it pushes or changes a character relationship, or it's a morality or an ethical choice, you know, like, oh, am I going to be a good guy or a bad guy? And then, or possibly it's a strategic choice, like, oh, I'm going to side with this person here because I think it's going to get me something in the future. Sometimes it's because we haven't made a choice in a while. Usually not the best. <laughs> Uh, and the great thing about this list is the more of these things you have, the better the choice is going to be. You don't have to just have one. Uh, and sometimes it can also be, we haven't made a choice in a while, but you can, uh, the more of these things you can fold into a choice, I think the stronger it becomes and the more engaged the player is. So now that we've talked about what good choices are, I just want to talk really quickly about choices and consequence, because this is something that even at Telltale we talk about a lot, and uh, there are misconceptions. Choices are not the same things as consequences. Choices are basically about what is happening right now. A choice is something that happens in the moment. It's, you know, all of a sudden, uh, we obviously have that, that timer at Telltale where we only give you a, a period of time to answer a choice, and we try to really treat them as kind of immediate things, the way that you would treat, you know, talking to somebody. You can't just go and make a sandwich while your friend waits for you to come up with something to say. So choices are about the now, and that means giving the player enough information in the moment to weigh their options and feel informed. The information they have might not be good, but they should at least feel like they have what it takes to evaluate two things, three things, whatever, and make the best choice that they can. Like an example of a poorly informed choice would be, say I'm making a game and it's the first day of class in this game and the teacher introduces me and asks me if I want to sit next to Amy or John. I don't know Amy and I don't know John. Technically, it's a choice, but I have literally no information to decide why it would be good to sit next to that person or that person. If in the previous scene, I'd been hanging out at the school cafeteria and I'd met both of them and Amy had been kind of a jerk and John had been really nice, now I have information where I can choose who I want to sit next to. You know, it's basically setting up a choice in a way so that the player has a little bit of information to go on to feel good about making a selection. Um, obviously, all sides should be compelling. I cannot emphasize this enough. <laughs> uh, and the choice should have, an, in some way, an immediate payoff. Choices are about now. So uh, a great example would be if the Amy and John thing, I go and I sit next to Amy. You know, immediately something has changed, the state has changed. But it doesn't have to be a big change. It could literally be a character giving me some side eye because I made this choice where it's like, oh no, she's judging me, what did I say? You know, just something needs to change uh, based on choices that you've made. Consequences are different. Consequences are about the future. So what's interesting about a consequence is consequences can be unintended uh when i make a choice i usually don't want to be surprised you know uh, it's okay to be surprised sometimes but you know if i choose to sit next to amy i don't want the teacher to force me to actually go sit in the back of the class like that's not what i chose to do and it doesn't feel as good consequences are different uh they're things that happen down the line and oftentimes a consequence might not have been obvious when i made a choice also 
um, consequences are awesome in that they can recontextualize um, previous choices that I made, where in the moment I might have thought it was a great idea to sit next to Amy, but later when I found out that Amy was a real jerk, um, uh, I felt bad about that retroactively. That's okay for consequences to do it, and in fact, consequences make choices even juicier and better. In my opinion, the way it works is great choices have consequences, but every choice should matter. And the final thing I'll say about this is, I'm sure you've played a game where you've made a choice and the game doesn't seem to react to it in the moment, but then later you found out that it actually had a huge difference, you know, that you, didn't, you weren't aware of. It, it can be frustrating if you don't feel like the game is listening to you at the moment that you made the choice. If you put down that game because you're like, oh, this game isn't listening to me, you'll never stay, the player won't stick around to find out what that amazing consequence was. So having the balance of both is really important. So with that in mind, creating branching narrative, we call it branching narrative like the branches of a tree. Um, and branching narrative is the marriage of both of these things, choices and consequences. It's like this really interconnected series of, you know, you make all these different choices, different consequences are paying off, and before you know it, you have this really rich experience that feels like it's being uh, driven and created by your players, and like, that's, that's the jam, that's what you want. Um, the goal is, uh, uh, and again, thinking about narrative design, immersing our players in this world that we've created. The game and the story at Telltale are the same thing for us. So our primary, as designers, our primary mechanic is the story, which is kind of an interesting situation to be in. Um, and uh, basically, the biggest thing about designing for a branching narrative is that you have to really design your entire game around these big choices early. Uh, layering in choices later uh, is just a huge pain, and I'm going to explain why that is in a moment. But um, figuring out where your big branches are earlier and planning for them is important. And don't start with like a, a straight line story uh, and put those branches in afterwards because you will really regret it. And uh, I have an example as to how this kind of works. So here's a great example of a problem choice using a movie hopefully you've seen because um, I'm going to spoil it. Um, Lord of the Rings uh, from the Fellowship of the Ring. So here's the setup, you know, Frodo is standing over the lava, ring in hand, uh, Sam is battling with Gollum in the background, and a choice space comes up. Throw the ring into the fire, keep the ring for yourself. Uh, so on the face of it, what is wrong with this choice? It's actually not super problematic uh, just looking at it. It does a couple of things right. Two very distinct rails. I'm a good person. Uh, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to throw this ring into the fire. Or uh, I'm going to keep the ring for myself because of a lot of complex issues that I'm probably battling with. <laughs> Or uh, also there's a really obvious branch. <laughs> like I can see where this is going. Uh, I feel informed of, of what's gonna happen. So what's wrong with it? The choices are unequally weighted. And this is something that I have found through experience. Um, most players play good. Uh, I don't know what it is, like uh, people, actually it gives me a lot of faith in humanity. <laughs> um, if you offer a choice where you can be a good guy or a bad guy, I find usually it boils down to an 80-20. Uh, people like to be the hero, uh, which isn't super surprising, but it makes a choice like this really unequally weighted. Uh, and we look at why that is. You know, if we throw the ring into the fire, we get to save our friends and we get to save the world. We keep the ring for ourselves, we get to cause some real problems for everybody uh, and probably become Gollum, I think. So uh, it's pretty obviously weighted. And uh, I think, how to say, like what's annoying about it is uh, it's just like, it's a calculation, isn't it? Because you look at it and if I'm choosing to play good, this is not a choice anymore. Uh, it's decided from the beginning. If I want to be a good guy, I'm always going to throw that ring away. And if I want to be a bad guy, well, I'm always going to keep the ring for myself. And that's the big issue I have with it. So how would we fix something like this? Say we'd gotten very far in the process and we'd started testing this choice and we're getting 80% of players picking one side. That's not what I want. So let's look at our pros and cons. So obviously on one side we've got good things and on the other side we've got bad things. The most basic way to fix this is to scramble them. 
So maybe I could save the world. 80% of people really like to be good guys, so that's compelling, but it will screw over all the characters that I've made friends with over the course of the game. Okay, that's, that's better. Or, you know, maybe I can save my friends, the people that I have really close, immediate relationships with that I've probably worked on making incredible choices throughout this, this game, and I can save them, but the entire world will burn. Uh, that kind of plays different um, player motivations against each other in a way that creates a much more compelling choice. However, I will say that this would change a lot of the very fundamental uh, points of the premise of The Lord of the Rings, and that is why you need to create a game around choices. If I had to change this at the end of the development cycle, I would screw up so much of the plot of the previous parts of the game, we would probably be looking at a 50% rewrite at best. So coming up with choices early and balancing them early and creating a game around that, that's so important. That's why you don't put choices in later. Um, just moving forward, so usually a lot of the choices we remember in branching narrative are big ones. They're like, oh, did I, you know, burn this town down or did it survive? Things like that. It's not just about those big branches. Big branches don't mean anything if your players aren't invested. It doesn't matter, like, how many amazing end states your game has if the player doesn't really feel connected to your world. So. The biggest part of my job uh, as a narrative designer is actually trying to anticipate what the player will care about before they play the game and building my choices around those things. Uh, this requires a lot of uh, testing and working with players and iterative kind of content, but you know, kind of figuring out what they care about and then tying those ideas to our choices. Again, it seems basic, but it's so important. Um, using our Lord of the Rings sort of metaphor, so uh, a cool kind of big branch choice might be, do I go to Gondor or Mirkwood for help? You know, on one hand, I'm gonna, you, like, it's a basically, do I want to side with the humans or the elves? I feel like I've seen this choice in a million different games, right? Like, it's kind of a race issue, I guess. It's a political, socio-political kind of choice. It's not bad, like, it tells me something about myself, thinking about our list, but it's also, you know, like, I don't really have a lot to sink my teeth into uh, about the world. Maybe I don't have strong feelings about humans or elves, you know? How do we make it stronger? <sighs> There's a character solution. Put a character you care about in each town. All of a sudden, I actually find players care about specific characters a lot more than they care about plot. So if I put Aragorn in Gondor and Legolas in Mirkwood, now all of a sudden this race kind of choice becomes more of a choice between who do I want to hang out with, which is pretty compelling. Another possible issue, you could have a consequence. Maybe the orcs are on my tail and whoever I go to is gonna, that town or that area will get burned to the ground. So I'll get the allies I need, but I'll actually cause them trouble at the same time. Again, this makes what can be a very, you know, pretty straightforward choice into something a little more complex, something the player has to agonize about a little more. Small branches support big branches. And when I say that, you really need both. And small branches, those are your day-to-day -day choices. I'd say only 5% of choices in a game are really big ones that are gonna branch the content in a super obvious way. Um, but all of those incidental small choices, that's where you get your player investment. That's where players get excited about characters and ideas that help inform the big choices that we offer later. And examples of these, these are branching character relationships, state changes, things like, you know, uh, does this character have their arm or not? Did I create a situation where they had to cut it off or did that town burn down or did I save it? And then finally, faction alliances, like did I make an alliance with this gang in act one, but now I have to screw over this gang in act two because of my motivations changing? Oh, that's awkward. Um, these are all things that when I create situations like this, it makes a lot of texture and richness for those big branches. <sighs> so, I mentioned plot and character a bunch, uh, and uh, I find uh, from experience that, you know, it's kind of funny, right? When you come up with a game, usually you think about the plot a lot, like what's gonna happen, where are we gonna go, what are we gonna do? Um, but in my experience, it's not the plot that motivates players, it's actually these character relationships. Specifically, again, talking about um, the kind of games I make, the branching narrative ones. People like to talk to people, and people like people to like them. <laughs> so, 
Um, what do you care about more? Here's a very obvious, like, kind of funny example. Do you care more about Han Solo and Princess Leia ending up in a relationship together, or is my clicker not going to work? There we go. Or do you care about the ramifications of the Trade Federation's blockade on Naboo? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it's a really kind of a, it's, it's just an example where it's like, characters ground plot. Use character relationships to make me care about your very complex ideas. If you find the plot of your game slowly spiraling out of control, and this happens to everybody, <laughs> where it's like over time it becomes more and more complicated, the easiest hack I've found is to have your player care or have your NPCs care about things and use them as visual spoke piece, uh, sp spokespeople for these issues. Um, so obviously, to do this, make sure you have fleshed out NPCs. You want to give them arcs. You want to make sure that they are people that care about things. And actually, once you do this, it, 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 it's like connecting the dots. Like It becomes so much easier when you know who, what everybody cares about. And sometimes you might find that you have a hole, and you can tweak an NPC's personality to fix it. Uh, and, and it'll really help your choice space. Create situations where you can't make everybody happy. Uh, players want everybody to be happy. Making situations where they can't do that or where that's very difficult uh, gives players a sense of success when they do. Um, it feels really good. Um, forcing players to choose a side. This is something we do a lot at Telltale. Um, and uh, I think it's very much true to life. Like You can't make everybody happy in life, so why should you make everybody happy in your games? So, with that in mind, the thing I always like to ask myself with any choice is, can this change a character relationship? If I've got a choice that isn't doing a lot of work, maybe it's one of those problem choices that's simply moving the plot along, look at the NPC roster of people who might be present or you could bring in to be present and see if any of them have an opinion on what you're choosing. Uh, when the player makes a meaningful choice, think about how that can affect those relationships. Uh, a real quick note on killing characters off, because this is something I feel like Telltale is kind of known for. Um, it's, it's something you want to be really careful about. Uh, I don't think you should do it uh, thoughtlessly. I don't think anybody does it thoughtlessly, but specifically when you kill a character off based on a player choice. Um, so if you give a player a choice to save someone, make sure that person remains important in your game in some way. Uh, there's nothing more disappointing than saving a character that it's obvious to the player that this person was meant to die. You know, or it's like, oh, they just sort of went on a vacation and weren't in the rest of the game. It sucks. <laughs> Uh, secondarily, dead characters still matter. If I made a choice that ended up in a character dying, uh, you bet your butt uh, that we should have a scene later where I really wish that character was here. Um, stupid example would be, I kill off my lock-picking friend and then I encounter a locked door. Damn it! <laughs> what was I thinking? Uh, creating situations, again, by fleshing out your NPCs, knowing what they're good at, knowing what they care about, you can create situations where they will be missed, uh, where their voice will be missed. So... With all of that in mind, how the hell do you plan a choice-based game? It's kind of like being Neo and looking into the Matrix. There's so much. Um, so first, what we don't do is we don't make a straight line story and put the choices on top. We create an outline for each scene and the things I ask myself on a very basic level, what can the player change? When you start at the outline phase on a branching narrative game, it's okay to think about things kind of like a movie script, but look at every, uh, every facet of that outline and ask myself, like, how do I change it? What can I change? What would be coolest to change? And what is the scene about emotionally? Uh, at Telltale, each scene we do, and we divide our scripts up based on scenes, uh, there, are, there are player goals and then there are emotional goals. Uh, the answer should never be, it's where you learn this piece of information. Uh, information is kind of a side. Uh, it's something that should happen incidentally over the course of a very interesting conversation or a, 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 an emotional kind of confrontation, but it's never the primary reason we have a scene. Uh, the primary reason you have a scene is to make your player feel something. Um, 
start big and work down, uh, coming up with just an overall idea of what would be most awesome. Honestly, this is how I think of scenes. Like, it's just like, what would be the coolest thing to have Star-Lord do? Uh, let's make a scene around that and then try and narrow in on the emotional content. And also just knowing your character arcs. Knowing your NPC arcs will allow you to figure out how we can change and manipulate them. Uh, knowing where they're gonna go so that we can branch that content is so important. If you know who everyone is, you'll always know what will piss them off. Uh, and I love pissing people off. Uh, finally, plan different arcs for your player character. Your player character is no different from an NPC. Just because the player is controlling them, that doesn't mean that their arcs don't matter. And in fact, they're the most important of all. Uh, don't lock your players into a specific arc or rail. Um, you know, they play in different styles, and I find a lot of the time you'll come up with this great story and you'll really want players to experience this one piece of content. That is not what branching narrative is about. It's about letting players play in the way that they want to play and not, uh, uh, and rewarding them no matter what they choose. There's no right or wrong way to play a branching narrative game. Uh, finally, just keeping it personal. Uh, branching narrative is about emotions, and emotions are personal. So you can make a branching narrative game about almost anything, as long as it's personal. Uh, the one note I will make is things like supervillains or apocalyptic scenarios are great backdrops, but they are not amazing uh, personal motivation on a scene-to-scene -scene level. Uh, just make sure that the player's moment-to-moment -moment motivation is personal and that the immediate goal, it shouldn't be something that can't happen until the end of the game. There should always be something that we're working toward. I think this is a pretty basic concept, but weirdly, it's something that gets lost when you're working in a purely narrative-based game. Uh, we encounter this problem a lot. Example of small personal stakes, things that you can build a game around. Uh, I find like a small group trying to survive in the apocalypse. Apocalypse is a great backdrop, but the small group with the infighting, that's great personal stakes. Uh, solving a mystery with a group of friends, you know, like, oh, somebody's murdering people and we have to, you know, band together to figure it out, but is this person the murderer that I'm talking to right now? I don't know. Like, these are great personal stakes. And basically anything that happens in a high school, <laughs> like, drama is great for branching narrative, and uh, I'd love to make a high school game. <laughs> anyway. Um, so now I just have some really basic kind of tips and tricks, ideas. Uh, so these are all things, I'm gonna drink water. I'm dying. Um, so these are just things that I do on the job a lot and I thought they were really practical, so I'm just gonna offer them to you. Um, first of all, I mentioned feeders earlier in the talk. I really believe this. A choice is only as good as its feeder. That last line or that situation that, uh, uh, that leads into the choice space, that is critical. Um, avoid, uh, blah, 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 blah. avoid yes, no questions. Um, and also avoid what do you think questions. So yes, no questions lead to calculations usually. They're, um, and at the very ba most base, they're just pretty bland. It's like they're basic binary questions. I don't find them particularly interesting for choices. And then, what do you think questions? Like, well, what do you think about a situation? What I hate about what do you think questions is they betray the fact that the player is not driving. <laughs> if somebody asks what I think, it's obvious that I am not in control of the situation and I'm not, I'm not the one moving the plot forward. Now, there are always places for these, but as a rule, if I notice that we're having a lot of what do you think type questions, it might be time to reevaluate what a scene is doing. Best feeders elicit emotional responses from a player. So as a narrative designer, my job is to figure out what you're going to feel, or even better, make you feel things. So I've got an example of a bad feeder. Um, so maybe I'm talking to a friend, say I'm making my dream game in a high school, and uh, a friend of mine comes up to me and she says, you like him, don't you? Choice space comes up. It's not bad. Um, but it is a yes-no question. It's like, yes, I like him. No, I don't. Um, it's just like, <laughs> it's just like, I don't really, you know, it's like, or, or I guess, yes, I like him. No, I don't. Maybe, I don't know. Um, a better feeder would be, there is no point in hiding it. It is obvious you like him. Uh, what I love about this is my NPC character has already made a judgment. If I'm a character, who, if I'm playing a player character who likes this person, 
uh, now I'm gonna feel like the game has been listening to me and I'm gonna have a, an actual choice where it's like, oh, well, do I wanna tell this NPC that I like this guy? Like, can I trust her? Like, what? If I don't like the person, then I have an immediate reaction where it's like, no, ew, absolutely not. Which again, I know like it's an easy choice base to create. Uh, so creating a feeder that has judgment in it that elicits an emotional player response actually makes creating your choice base a lot easier. Less bland choices, in my opinion. Um, I also have another very functional tip for feeders. Uh, this is super useful at Telltale. I, I don't know if you'll find it. I think it's interesting, but uh, so there are a lot of times where it's difficult to come up with the right feeder line. Like you know the situation, you know kind of the choice you want to offer, but you can't figure out exactly how to make it sing. This happens all the time. So what a narrative designer at my job does is we basically create kind of a rough draft of scripts. Uh, we work with writers to do this. And so I'll have a choice space in mind, and then I will kind of plan it. So I'm like, say we're in a situation where we're meeting up friends at an abandoned warehouse, but our friends didn't show. So me and my buddy walk in, and the warehouse is completely empty. And my friend says, uh, where is everyone? Choices come up. Maybe they left, let's look around, I don't like this. Pretty functional choice space, it's really moving the plot along. Um, I will actually write fake versions of what I could imagine the player character saying if they click this choice. So say I write, maybe they left. Maybe the player character says, I don't know, maybe they went home. If I choose, let's look around, they say, let's look, they've gotta be here somewhere. Or if I say I don't like this, you know, I've got a bad feeling about this. I look at these different choices that I've made and they all feel kind of bland. So what I do is I'll pick one that the player is saying and I'll actually give it to the NPC as a feeder. So in this version, I've got a bad feeling about this is probably the most interesting of the things that I've got to say. So what I'll do is I'll erase everything I just did and I'll give I've got a bad feeling to the, about this to the NPC that I'm with. And now I have different choices off of that. So weirdly, if you're having trouble coming up with a choice space that's working for you, just go with it and then take the most interesting one that you've got your player character saying, give that as the feeder and try again. And you can just keep repeating. And oftentimes you'll come up with far more interesting feeders this way. Um. Role-playing rails, are my choices different enough? Uh, so this is a big thing that we talk about a lot at work too. Um, we call it staying in your lane. Uh, and there are different kind of, uh, of choices that we can offer, but I notice this a lot in different games where you'll get a choice base, but it's three very similar ideas. Um, when you don't stay in your lane, you highlight how unimportant a choice space is. And what I mean when I'm saying that is these the rails will overlap. So I'm gonna give an example situation. So say an NPC like drops their mug in front of you or like a dish on the ground and they start crying. It's pretty weird, right? Choices come up. I'm worried about you. Like, why are you crying? Uh, is there anything I can do? And uh, let me help you with that. Like, again, it's fine, they're choices, but they're all kind of the same, aren't they? Like, each one is concerned. What if I hated that NPC? As a player, I would not feel like I had anything to really go to that would allow me to express that. Um, so, a way to make the rails distinct without actually having to change too much is just putting judgment in these choices. I'm worried about you still works. I am genuinely worried about somebody who starts crying over a broken dish. What is your problem? Again, it's asking what is going on, but there's a lot of judgment in that statement. Or, it was an ugly mug anyway. This is kind of your, this is like your humor deflection choice. But each one of them has kind of a point of view. One is concern, one is uh, negative judgment, and one is kind of a flippant joke. Uh, this gives the player a lot more to read into, to role play with, than the top. Um, 
Just a quick note on blank slate characters, because I've kind of railed on them a little bit in this talk. I think they're really hard. And the reason that blank slate characters, and when I talk about a blank slate character, I mean like a character that they don't speak unless you make a choice. Uh, they're common in video games, and they can be really fun to play, but they are really difficult to support. Uh, and the reason that is is, um, they allow for a broader range of player expression. If literally they're only talking when I say something, uh, they can be anything, which is terrifying when you're making choice space. Um, for the player to feel ownership, these rails that they have in their choices, those have to be really broad. Uh, this leads to a lot of rail simplification, where it's basically holy choice and evil choice. Um, these are the ways that you can easily support um, while keeping kind of a, a, a blank slate character alive. Um, but sometimes that can really simplify the player experience. Even though you feel like you always have something to lean on, uh, it's, it's not the most nuanced. Allowing the player character to talk outside of player control will really help define your choice space. So even if it's just here or there, like little things. I remember when I played um, Deus Ex Human Revolution for the first time, and I found a catalog on my coffee table in one of the first scenes where it was on fixing clocks. I literally exclaimed to myself, I was like, oh, I like fixing clocks. Like, I have a hobby. Like, these are the things that make your player characters feel alive, even if they are blank slate characters. Um, be aware of context. This is just a minor note, but can you pick your gender, your race, something else? Um, these are things that, i um, sorry, I went a little, I went too far. Um, these are things that will really recontextualize your choices. Uh, if you have the same line that fires for a male or a female character, something that sounds fine coming out of a dude's mouth may not sound so fine coming out of a lady's mouth. It's just something to be aware of, I find. And then finally, not everyone will see any, everything. Um, branching narrative is super frustrating because sometimes your best stuff is not going to get seen. And it is so tempting to try to make that stuff happen uh, on the critical path of your game. Like, oh, this is so good. Everyone needs to see it. That is really not what branching narrative is all about. Branching narrative is about drinking a beer at 10 o'clock at night, watching a YouTube playthrough, and screaming at the screen, begging them to pick a choice, but they don't pick it. And you're like, no. Um, really, I just think that offering Compelling stuff on both sides is so important and not falling for the trap of trying to make people see the, the best stuff. Um, and finally, I just want to say, um, these are all uh, ideas and rules that I have learned making these games, but they are made to be broken. I think it's these ideas are super useful for me, and they have been very useful in coming up with the basics of coming up with compelling choices, but that doesn't mean you have to do these things. There are really great examples of games that don't comply to these rules. They conscientiously break them, and they're amazing. So I just think they're, in, uh, they're useful things to think about when you decide to not do, uh, when, you, when you have a choice where there's a right or a wrong answer, for example, there are great choices that are like that. But just being aware of, of what you're doing and why you're doing it is really important. Experimentation is so important. So that's it. <laughs> Dude, I timed this talk at my house and it was like 58 minutes and I must have motor mouthed because we've got like 10 minutes left. So I, don't, I think we can do questions. Yeah, if anybody's got any. Oh God. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, because I've noticed in some of the games that uh, when you get a choice, uh, you get just text. But sometimes it doesn't accurately represent what the character actually will say and the way they will say it. Uh, do you feel it's difficult to accurately translate between these two? Oh, man. Yes, is the easy answer. <laughs> um, so at Telltale, we do a thing called, we call it display text which is entirely um, narrative designer's job to control. Um, but uh, at Telltale, like I mentioned briefly before, narrative designers and writers um, share custody of the script and the story. And so often, uh, display text is a living thing that will evolve over the course of the script being written. 
Um, sometimes when you experience a dissonance between the two, it might be that a line got tweaked and the narrative designer simply didn't get the memo. Um, that's not ideal. <laughs> um, but also, uh, one of the things I kind of, I think is really fascinating about display text is we have a very short um, character limit on display text and uh, trying to capture the feeling of a, a, a really interestingly written line, that's the art of creating good display text. And it's something that I will noodle with until the very last minute. In fact, one of the last things I did before I came here was I was fixing display text in uh, the episode of Guardians of the Galaxy that we're about to ship. So it's uh, one of the last things to come online. It is very difficult to get correct. And it's, it's a definitely a psychology thing where it involves the narrative designer really having to look at text and trying to imagine how players read it and interpret it. Um, so it is not easy. I hope that answers it, kind of. Um, uh, do you have any uh, uh, examples of a, uh, of a choice not made through dialogue or presented through dialogue? Uh, yes, actually. I have a really great one, at least for me. Um, I was playing, uh, actually Jane did a wonderful talk yesterday on Firewatch. Um, when I picked up that game for the first time, uh, you know, I was experiencing it and really enjoying myself, and there are good dialogue choices in it, but my favorite choice from that game was not dialogue at all. Um, it was when, uh, I don't know if you played Firewatch, I won't spoil it, but there are um, a couple of girls in this lake, and they're like uh, violating a lot of, I don't know, rules for the state park. And uh, you're trying to have this conversation, like you're yelling at these girls, they're really far away in the middle of this lake, and their boombox is playing really loudly on the beach next to you. And like without thinking of it, I picked up the boombox and I just threw it into the water and it stopped playing, which is what I wanted. But they immediately started screaming at me for breaking their boombox, and I was like, oh God, I did do that, didn't I? Like, I'm a park ranger and I just destroyed their property. Uh, I think some of the best choices actually require no dialogue at all. It was a great example of like me being put in a situation where what I wanted to do, it felt really natural, but I got totally called out on it instantly. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just uh, wondering uh, if, uh, when you have story games, how do you deal with like ex uh, existential themes, like uh, existential themes or themes. choices, like? Oh, no um, yes. I actually. Well, I guess it depends on your interpretation of existential themes. Um, uh, like, um, uh, if you have two hard choices, it's easier to, to, uh, to take the easy choice. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually, so I have a kind of a complicated view on hard and easy choices. Uh, on a textbook level, it's good to have your choice. We always shoot to have like say a 60-40 or a 50-50 style breakdown. There are certain situations where you can look at a choice and you're like, this is not going to be a 60-40. This is going to be an 80-20 or a 90-10. But what you're choosing says something so interesting about yourself that it is worth it. Um, and uh, there's actually one that's about to come out, not on an episode I worked on, but I, was, I, I saw it and I was just like, ah. Oh. I wish I could talk about it, I can't. Um, but it's definitely gonna be like a 95-5, like everybody's gonna pick this one side. But it's worth it uh, because, yeah, again, like a, a good choice will put you in a place where um, even if it's an easy choice, it definitely teaches you something about yourself. So existential themes are definitely something that should be in a lot of the choices that you make and we try to fold in but you're right they can unbalance your choices and that can be okay it just depends on what you're trying to tell like the story you're trying to create um, especially if they're well built like if your entire game is kind of building around an existential choice where there are a lot of little ideas that lead to it i actually am a big fan of those
Hey Molly, my name is Katrina. Uh, I just started writing my master thesis on digital culture regarding this kind of genre of games. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is super relevant and thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you've noticed any sort of um, trends in this genre of games or what kind of games are people making? Uh, trends? Well, I definitely think that recently we've seen a lot of uh, a higher influx of choices in games, which makes me super excited. I think it's something that takes a little while to pick up. Um, so uh, I think, I, I don't know if I could say, I'm not, you know, again, I work in the industry, but I'm not like an amazing predictor of like the future of what we're going to be doing. Like I just enjoy making video games. But yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of new branching narrative games. I mean, if you'd asked me like 10 years ago, what it was basically Bioware was making them and, uh, and a couple of other niche -er studios. And now, I mean, God, Uncharted has choices in it, for God's sake. You know, it's crazy. So I would say it is, uh, I think it's indicative of the fact that people want more control over the video games that they're making. But I'd be lying if I said that branching narrative or dialogue trees is the only way to do this. There are so many ways for the player to kind of choose and drive the story. And I think that's why you see more and more narrative designers popping up in, in game team wrecks and things like that. Um, that. We're trying to solve these problems and kind of give you that ownership. Thank you very much. I was also wondering if you'd have some time after this to discuss. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely be around. Wonderful, thank you. I also you. have, a, I'm going to be on a panel at one as well, so. Great. Talk to you later then. <laughs> uh, hi. In several Telltale games, there are often the, uh, the option to stay silent in conversation instead of answering. How is it like designing that so that it becomes natural to not answer and not just see, make it seem awkward or unnatural? Oh my God. Um, so uh, this is a very, um, uh, uh, if you ask uh, dif different telltale designers, we'll have different answers to this question. Um, myself, I find the maddening uh, silent options um, because silence can mean so many different things. When we talk about display text, like I was mentioning earlier, my job is to create text that the player will really understand what they're going to be uh, doing or saying. Silence, you know, a silence can mean Big B uh, moodily smoking a cigarette or it can mean uh, Jesse from Minecraft story mode, like angrily staring down a character or, you know, like crossing your arms and looking away or making somebody feel uncomfortable. Silence can mean so many different things. Um, so I find them interesting in that if you pick silence, you're kind of rolling those dice to see uh, <laughs> what it's going to mean. Um, but uh, coming up with a new one every time, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't really hard. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm a really big fan of like story games and Telda games in general, but there's always one thing that, that really confuses me because mostly every, just every game starts with like your choices matters, they have consequences, and it might be a little spoiler for what I'm going to ask as well. But for Walking Dead season one, we have like the end, the end for the last episode. We have uh, uh, Clementine can choose to either leave Lee or or shoot shoot him. But how on different games, again, spoiler again, for Life is Strange, for example, where you have the option to either save Arcadia Bay or save Chloe, and you have built up all the choices, all this either help people or be rude to them. Why does say that choices matter when it pretty much just all gets reset or when you don't, you, you could either save a person or an entire city? Mm. How does that affect for people? Um, well, I will say, well, A, I'm a huge fan of Life is Strange, and I think that they do some really great stuff. Um, I think it's a philosophical difference, certainly, and I don't think that we lie when we say choices matter, because, uh, again, as somebody who works behind the scenes uh, and, and works on these things, we do actually add up a lot of your choices and change things. But it's kind of a fascinating thing, and this is a really great tip um, if you're making branching narrative, there's such a thing as um, uh, 
So there's a desire when you make stories where no matter what branch a player is on, you want to make it smooth. You want to make it feel really natural. Um, you don't want them to know uh, that, um, you know, they, you want it to feel like it, 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 you're, they're experiencing the best version of the story, no matter what branch they're on. But one of the pitfalls of this is if you do that too much, uh, people will think that that is the only way that the game could end. <laughs> so uh, it's actually an interesting thing. I think one of the things Life is Strange does really well is they are super transparent about um, like uh, what you didn't do, and they will constantly call you out on it. Like, you chose not to do this, so I'm mad at you right now because of this thing. It makes it very obvious um, that you picked something and that you're seeing the ongoing ramifications of that choice. I think Telltale does choose uh, to kind of create a, 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 a for instance, in the, in the lens of Walking Dead season one, that was a story that everyone knew was going to lead to a very kind of heartbreaking personal kind of choice. And it wasn't the kind of choice that could save Lee's life or not, but it was a difficult choice to be involved with in a, in a different way. It was a very personal choice uh, to stay or go. Um, and I think that that was, you know, it's not a big branch, but I think it's a, a small choice that really resonated with a lot of people. So they're just uh, different games kind of choose to treat uh, branching narrative in different ways would be the simple answer, I guess. I assume someone will yank me off the stage when it's time. Uh, so this might be a somewhat uh, uncomfortable question to answer, and I don't even know if you're allowed to answer it. I'm a big fan and all, but um, it's quite the thing you talked about. In, uh, when, char when you are really involved in a character, you expect them to pay off in a way, I guess. And there's a really specific case with two characters in season two. You were involved in that game, right? Uh, season two, I was actually still a concept artist. Oh, so yeah. So I concepted for season two. Okay. But I did not design. But I'm still going to ask it anyways. Okay, go, go nuts. Are. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> it's the case of the characters Sarah and Nick. Okay. Um, the, both characters, you, you have a lot of choices and a lot of ways to kind of give up on them. Mm -hmm. So you feel like the two characters are building up to something. Mm -hmm. And when the time comes, it really doesn't. It is one of those cases I know where this is going. Yeah, yeah and it, it, it's, it was the thing you talked about earlier, where you said it's hard when you make these branches and you don't really know where they are going. What was, do you know, the process of, uh, were you leading up to something you just weren't able to do, or what was the case? I will say, so Sarah... Um, and uh, well, both of those characters, uh, one of the reasons that I had that section on killing off characters. <laughs> uh, uh, there are a lot of situations that lead to uh, different, different things that need to happen in a story. You can tell I'm very diplomatically walking around this question. I will say, I mean, we're all here because we love to make games and there are a lot of reasons why certain things happen. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, I'm going to think about this for a moment. I know very, uh, so I'm good friends with uh, some of the people that were involved in episode four, and I will be honest and say that they cared a lot about both of those characters and that there were many different situations that they could have ended up in. Um, but sometimes uh, our hands get tied uh, based on different needs. And uh, I know that the people who wrote that episode tried to honor them in the best way that they could. But honestly, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Uh, and, uh, and it is difficult because we care very much about all of our characters and we don't like to let people down. But I will also say that when you make a game that is in the apocalypse, uh, Walking Dead is an amazing universe to work in. Much like life, uh, 
sometimes people don't get the amazing send-off that they deserve. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the amazing thing about being in the zombie universe. Um, and so uh, there are actually multiple ways that Sarah can meet her end in that episode. Uh, but she, in the end, was, was doomed, you know. And uh, that is difficult. But um, I don't know. I hope that answers it a little bit. I'm sorry I couldn't go more in depth. Yeah, it does. Thanks. <laughs> I think we have to stop there. Okay. Uh, but thank, you, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Molly is going to be around, uh, be around later as well. So 